Well, let's begin by reading uh, the, the passage that um, has the main point in it, which is all the Father gives me will come to me. Jesus says this in the context of those who had just been fed, you know, by the loaves and the fish, and they followed him across the, the sea, and uh, Jesus said, you follow me, not, you know, not because you want me, but because you want me to feed you. And, um, but he, um, he, he, he describes all of that in our text, but then he, he says something that we don't often think of in the context of evangelism which is that, and, and, you know, have, we have to think about this because, um, you know, what is it that the Lord uses to bring people to Himself? You know, is it extremely gifted people that bring, a, a, you know, a very passionate uh, plea uh, and, and who can move men's hearts by their, their presentation? I mean, Jesus basically is, is talking to these people with the, the absolute confidence that if the Father is going to give them or if He has given them to Him, they will come. And He doesn't seem to be, you know, urging them with this impassioned plea. And yet we know that God uses even those types of impassioned pleas to bring people to Him. So He works in a variety of ways, but ultimately it boils down to God's sovereignty in bringing people to himself. Okay, well, let's, let's read the text. Be John chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. When they, again, those who were fed, found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. By the way, if you're reading the book of Numbers, you've, you've read about that. Um, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of heaven is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. For this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Well, again, may the Lord bless his word to build us up this morning. Now, last week we looked at the Enlightenment, especially its, its core belief. Remember, this is what... Um, Dr. Godfrey emphasized, and uh, I believe R.C. Sproul as well, although we didn't watch the R.C. Sproul treatment, the core belief that man is not fallen and totally depraved, but that man is essentially good. It's, you see, we're not the problem as far as the Enlightenment thinkers were concerned, but that our real problem was a twofold problem, the first one being the church's superstitious belief system. Not only its declaration that man is fallen, and, you know, we, we should expect to see this evil. But the, the differences between, the, you know, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church were causing this constant fighting, and they were just tired of it. So the Enlightenment thinking was, thinkers were thinking the church is one of the problems. That's why people are, are hating and fighting each other. They're keeping us from reaching utopia, if I can put it in those terms. But the other problem was oppressive governments, and again, um, R.C. explained that, um, Dr. Godfrey didn't, but the idea that the more that we become dependent upon governments, 
And the more the government makes us dependent upon other people, the, the greater or the more we are dependent on someone for anything, the more likely it's going to be that they're going to exploit us. And, and that's going to be a problem. I think you can see a little bit of what Marx was thinking about when he says, let's do away with oppressive governments and let's just share everything and everything will be fine, okay? Well, <clears throat> if we can do away with these two things, we can reach a peaceful and mutually beneficial society. We can attain utopia. But now over against this enlightened belief, we did look at the sad truth that, that what they believe is not true. That man is fallen, man is totally depraved, totally corrupt, and completely unable to come to God. I should say he's completely averse from God. We are the enemies of God as we come into this world. Paul says this explicitly in Romans 8, verses 7 through 8. The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. And remember, the mindset on the flesh is the one who doesn't have the spirit in a saving way. Okay, it's hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Is it any surprise that Paul, uh, when he's characterizing the kind of people that Jesus came into the world to save, he says, while we were his enemies, his, we were his enemies, he sent Christ into the world to save us. You know, we are his enemies. We were hostile toward him. We hated him. We would not submit to him. And Jonathan Edwards tells us that all we need to do is look at the world around us, and it will prove to us that what the Bible says is, in fact, the case. He writes in his book, Original Sin, quote, all mankind constantly in all ages without fail in any one instance run into moral evil, <laughs> close quote. Now, being in this condition, we saw that there's really nothing we can do to save ourselves. And there's really nothing we can do even to receive the gift that God offers to us through the gospel. Jesus said to his disciples when they said, you know, if the rich can't be saved, who then can be saved? Jesus said, with man, it is impossible, okay, but not with God. With God, all things are possible, and this is the key. Now, tonight, Dr. Godfrey is going to tell us about what the Lord was doing in England at the same time the Enlightenment was going on, and then as we move, well, actually, we're going to see that what happens in England, but also what happens in New England um, next week with the Great Awakening. He said that there would be um, long-term problems that the Enlightenment would cause, but there are also short-term problems that the church had to face at that time. Religion and moral immorality, I should say, um, I should say religion and morality had taken a steep decline in England and the church was helpless to do anything about it. But into this dark situation, the Lord sends light. You know, I love this quote by J.C. Ryle in his uh, book, uh, Christian Leaders of the 18th Century. This is the time frame we're talking about. And he talks about these, these preachers that the Lord raised up that Godfrey is gonna say the two main ones are Wesley and Whitfield, but there was a, a host of other people. But he raises them up at a time when society is in a very uh, dark situation. And the reason why he does that is so that when he sends the light into that situation, it is much more obvious. It's much more conspicuous. People see it. God is glorified much more. Well, this is what the Lord did by raising up these godly preachers to preach his gospel. And again, the two main uh, preachers will be, we're going to look at are going to be John Wesley and George Whitfield. But as we think about these two men and their zeal for the gospel, and as we prepare to learn more about, you know, exactly who they are and what they did this evening, this morning I want us to think about four things that, are, that we can sort of think about in this context. Uh, first of all, as we see their evangelistic zeal, we need to remember that our Lord has given to us also a responsibility to communicate the gospel. As we think about that responsibility, we need to be thankful that the message of the gospel is really relatively simple. 
and easy to explain. Now, I, I added this because um, this is what our, our inquirer's class is going to look at this morning and what we considered last week, right? It's how can we just share a very brief and simple gospel? How can we hold all those pieces together in our minds? So we'll, we'll review that this morning. Uh, we're going to be warned that we need to avoid the distortions that have crept into the church, and, and there are a few. But then finally, we need to answer this question. If man is as bad as the Bible actually portrays him to be, how will anyone ever respond to the gospel and be saved? Now, if we held Wesley's view, we might say no one's going to be saved theoretically. But we would say, well, everything depends on our persuasiveness. But if we hold to Whitfield's view, we realize that no matter how we share it, although Wes Whitfield, excuse me, believed very strongly that he needed to share it in the most passionate way that he possibly could, and that God would use that to affect people, he had the confidence that God would draw all men to himself. And we need to have that same confidence, and that's really the whole point. Now, the first thing we need to consider is that Jesus has given to us, again, the responsibility to communicate his gospel to others. When, when he charged his whole church with the Great Commission, we need to understand that being a part of that church, we also have a role to play. Now, we may not be called or even able to go to another country and become missionaries, but we do have the responsibility to reach out to the people who are around us. We may be uncomfortable sharing with strangers. You know, some people aren't. And we have seen, though, that oftentimes that's not terribly effective unless we maybe have a gift of evangelism. But we can certainly share the gospel with people we know. And I've said in the past, Kenneth Scott LaTourette said, this is the way the early church expanded. The, the, the main way it expanded was through friendship evangelism, people just getting to know people and, and communicating the gospel very naturally out of your relationship, you know, as you to share your life with those people. Uh, we can also, of course, teach our children the gospel. If they're grown and out of the house, we can share with them still as the Lord gives us opportunity. We can certainly pray that this work would advance. We can give to the cause of the church and to missions. We need to remember that this is what we're all about as the people of God, not, not to build our own kingdoms in this world, you know, not to just, as, as many churches seem to portray it, you know, gain, gain the safety, the, the certainty we're going to go to heaven, and then just kind of live our lives like everybody else does with, with that confidence. Really, what the gospel calls us to do is to give everything to the Lord and to use it as he would have us to use it for the advancement of this cause, okay? This is what the church is all about. This is what the Great Commission is all about. And we're going to see that this is what motivated Wesley and Whitfield, and this is why they were the kind of people they were. Remembering that the gospel is the only way that anyone is ever going to be saved, Jesus calls us to communicate it to others. Okay, that's the first point. Second point. The gospel is really quite simple. Okay, it's a simple message. Paul and Silas gave us a very handy summary, I think, in their reply to the Philippian jailer. When he asked, the Philippian jailer asked them how he could be saved. And remember, his reply was this, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the gospel in one sentence. And really, we can use this to share the gospel with other people. When Paul says, you will be saved, okay, we need to start there. The question is, saved from what? Why is it that people need salvation? Well, Paul writes in Romans, in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in 6.23, the wages of sin is death, not just physical death, but eternal death. The message is of the gospel, and this is, we need to, we need to start with this, because we, we need to see why we need Christ, right? We have all broken God's law and are liable to eternal judgment in hell. We need salvation from that, from the judgment that is owed to us for our sins. 
But again, there's nothing we can do about it. We, have, we don't have the power to do anything to save ourselves. So secondly, we must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's the middle. Remember, believe in the Lord, okay, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Saved from what? Judgment and hell. How can we be saved? The Lord Jesus Christ, okay? What we cannot do, remember the Father did. Jesus says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sent his son into the world, we know, to obey, to provide the only acceptable record of obedience, the only record God will accept, a perfect record. His obedience is important. And his death on the cross. He provided the only payment that the Father could ever accept for the crimes that we have committed, that of the spotless Lamb of God. What we could not do, God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ, but to receive it, we must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, believing is um, trusting. We have to trust Jesus. We need to uh, place our whole hope of heaven upon what he has done. Again, Jesus says in John 3.16, 3, God gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is more than believing facts. The devils believe and they tremble. What it means is looking entirely away from ourselves, from any good that we think that we might have done, and placing our whole hope of entering into heaven on what Jesus Christ has done alone. Now, let me just say this. If we know enough to actually be Christians, if we know enough to be saved, we know enough to share. We know enough to evangelize. It doesn't take special classes. It doesn't take seminary training. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It's just as simple as that. It does help to be able to explain that, though. We need, do, do need to fill that out a little bit, but at least it gives you an outline. Okay? Now, thirdly, we need to be careful to avoid the distortions of the gospel. And every distortion of the gospel adds something that we must do to what Jesus has done. It wasn't that long ago, remember, we were looking at the book of Galatians, and we were looking at what the Judaizers were saying to the Galatians, and they were saying, it isn't Jesus, you need Jesus, but what Jesus has done is not enough. You also need to be circumcised and observe the law of Moses, okay? That's one distortion. It adds works. Pelagius, early on in the church, 4th century, I believe, he believed that we don't really need Jesus at all. We only need to follow his example. So we don't need his obedience and his righteousness to save us, but we do need his example of perfect obedience because we need to follow that example, and he believed everybody could. How you get rid of your sins, I'm not really quite sure. But again, he makes it all works. It all depends on us, okay? Roman Catholicism teaches that baptism justifies us. And after we inevitably lose that justification by committing mortal sin, we need to repair it by going to a priest and confessing our sins, gaining absolution, and then performing the penance that he gives us to do. It's, it's a system of works. Charles Finney, you know, Dr. Godfrey is going to mention him as one of these great preachers, you know, that many believed that, that there were great preachers that the Lord raised up at certain times to advance the kingdom and that, that that's how the work goes on and Charles Finney was that great preacher. He actually was teaching a, a doctrine of works. Now, he did believe that we are justified by faith, but once we are justified by trusting in Jesus Christ, if we step off the line at all, we lose that justification. And we have to be justified again by trusting in Jesus Christ again. So the fact is, we, we may be justified by faith, but we need to keep our justification by works, by making sure that we are doing everything exactly right. And you know, many evangelicals believe that today, but they may give you a little bit more leniency as far as how far you can step off the path before you actually lose that justification. We need to remember that God works through the truth, doesn't he? He doesn't use these distortions. The truth is we are justified by God's grace alone, through faith alone. We receive it by faith alone. 
God's grace is providing His Son and His Spirit, but we receive it as a, as a, a gift freely given to us. We receive it by faith. That is the message we need to share with others. Again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, we understand that that entails a change of life, and that is the evidence that we've been justified, but that evidence is not what justifies us. It only shows that we have been justified. But again, fourth, we need to ask the question. If man is in the condition that we saw last week, remember, he's totally depraved, unable to save himself, unable even to receive the gospel, then how can we expect anyone to come to Christ? Now, within conservative Protestantism, there are really two main views. We call them Arminianism and Calvinism. Okay, Arminianism is, is reflected in the thought of John Wesley, although he had a little bit of a tweak here, and we'll get to that in a moment. And the Calvinistic Puritan view is really reflected in that of George Whitfield. Now, Arminians believe that we are not so bad as we might conclude from the Bible, that we're not completely fallen. The fall did not destroy the moral image of God in man, and that is that desire for good, but it is only marred it. So we have some remnant of it, some spark of goodness left in us, and that spark of goodness gives us the ability to believe. So everyone has the ability to believe. We're not totally depraved. Now, by the way, John Wesley had a, a tweak to this. Uh, he believed we're totally depraved. You know, he, he accepted what the Bible had to say about that. As we come into the world, that's the way we are. But he also believed that God gives what he calls a prevenient grace. I know that's a fancy word for just simply saying he gives to everybody who comes into the world, everyone who is born, he gives them a common grace that's prevenient in the sense that it comes before, that's what the word means, comes before we have to make this choice. And so when we come into the world, even though we're fallen, we're immediately given at least enough ability to choose for Christ if we are presented with him, okay? We have the power to choose. So again, you end up in the same camp, you have that ability. That's what Arminians believe. You have that ability. And then one other Arminian group that we would like to, or I'd like to include this morning is Lutheranism. Now, not Luther himself, but Melanchthon, who kind of kept this belief to himself while Luther was still alive. I mean, you can understand why that would be the case because you wouldn't want Luther thundering at you if you're, you know, believing something that the Bible doesn't teach. But Melanchthon secretly believed that it's not exactly as Luther believes. Uh, he believed that uh, man has something to do with this. So this is what Melanchthon believes. And by the way, Melanchthon was Luther's right-hand man. He was the theologian of the Lutheran movement. He was the one who drew up the, uh, the, the creeds for Lutheranism. But he believed that God works through the gospel when it's preached with his full power. Okay, God working as the gospel is preached, he's reaching out with his full power, with divine almighty power. And we will be saved if we're under the preaching of that gospel, if we simply don't do one thing, if we don't do something, okay, we can't resist. Now, how can you resist almighty divine power, full power? How can you resist that? I don't know, but he believed you could. And if you resisted it, you won't be saved. But if you don't resist, you will. So again, where does the, the ultimate decision for our salvation lie? Well, it doesn't lie with God, but it lies with us. We have to not resist. We need to let the gospel draw us to the Lord Jesus Christ, sort of give in to the power of God and go with it. Now again, Arminianism, or I should say Arminians believe that man is able, one way or another, to choose Christ on his own. And that's where John Wesley falls. But Calvinists, Puritans, George Whitfield, on the other hand, believe, again, as we believe, that because of the fall, man cannot make this choice. He's not able to make this choice. So how can we expect anyone to respond to the gospel? Well, we know God has to be the one to initiate. Jesus says this so plainly. How can we miss it? In John 6, 44, no one can come to me 
unless the Father who sent me draws him. Okay, or draws, yes, that's right, um, draws him. And he does do this. Okay, that's what we see in our text. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Okay, so let's not forget what that word draws mean. We saw that last time. Draw is not wooing. It's not giving reasons, not trying to convince people and, you know, sort of influence them to come to Christ. But the word actually means compels them, drags them, but not against their will. God changes their hearts and brings them by changing the heart that changes the exercise of the will. So now that they want the Lord, they will come to him irresistibly. All that the Father gives him will come by the Spirit's changing their hearts when they hear the gospel in his appointed time. Now, okay, so that's, okay, you've, got, you've got Wesley's view and you've got Whitfield's view. Does it make a difference in how evangelism takes place? Well, in most cases, not. There may not be any real difference in the way that, that Arminians and Calvinists communicate the gospel. They, they just, you know, they communicate the believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And how you conceive of how that all works out doesn't change that message, okay? That message is the same. And that's why both of these groups have been considered a part of the historic church. But obviously, there's going to be a difference in the understanding and the expectation of the one sharing the gospel when you know what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, Wesley expected man to exercise his free will, one that he actually doesn't have, right? Whereas Whitfield would expect that God would call his sheep by his word and his spirit. Now, this evening, we're going to see that God used both Wesley and Whitfield to gather his people together through the preaching of the gospel. Uh, he can use both, and he does use both. But I do want to, just in closing, point to one other difference. One other difference that this difference between Wesley and Whitfield makes, okay? Uh, something that's been largely lost to today, but could be relevant in certain situations, and you should be aware of it. And you've heard me talk about it before, or maybe not. We'll, we'll see, okay? Now, this is something Jonathan Edwards believed was very important. This was something that the Puritans believed that was very important, that this view, Calvinism, what the Bible believes regarding total depravity, teaches us what to do, okay? In those instances, when you come across a person who is willing to accept the facts, okay? They believe these things are true, and they're affected by the facts, okay? They know they're in danger. They're awakened, and we're going to hear a lot about awakening as we go through the Great Awakening, exactly what that means. You know, they're, they're concerned, okay? But they're still unconverted, okay? Now, let me just say both camps admit that this can happen, okay? This situation can occur, though today, as John Gerstner would say, it's very rare because according to him, two things, apologetics, Remember that huge course we went through and all the apologetics we've looked at? He said, because apologetics are so seldom used in the pulpit, we have very few people in this category. Now, Puritan pastors knew that they had unconverted people in their congregations. By the way, the Reformed camp doesn't necessarily approach it in the same way like the Continental Reformed, and Dr. Godfrey would not approach it in this way, but the Puritans would, okay? they understood that there were people in the congregation that were unconverted. And let's not forget that in those days, pretty much everybody in the entire society was in the church. So there's going to be unconverted people there. And they knew that those people would not respect what the Bible said, okay, because they don't have the Spirit of God. They, they don't love the Scriptures, okay? And maybe they're not even awakened, okay? So what these Puritan pastors would do would appeal to their reason. Jonathan Edwards would, would often switch gears and, and move from converted people to unconverted people, and he would begin to reason with them, again, from the evidence. 
He would point out the, that the evidence demands that, that God exists, and they know it, and they know that they're guilty, and the Bible is his word, and they need to do something about it, okay? This would often lead to awakening, okay? Awakening is when a person becomes concerned about their spiritual state. And let me say this, and this will help you maybe understand why it is that Godfrey, again, Dr. Godfrey is going to remind us this evening that there was so much emphasis on the law and why they believe people need to be thoroughly convicted before they came to Christ. Edwards believed that this awakening had to take place before a person could be converted, before they would ever be converted, at least in most instances. And when you think about it, it makes sense. If somebody is going to come to Christ, they have to have a reason to come to Christ. They have to ha see their need of Christ. You don't come to the Savior unless you see that you need the Savior. This awakening is usually brought about through the preaching of the law. But the difference between the person, you know, when you're preaching the law, the person who is awakened and isn't awakened is one person just kind of rolls off their back. They're unaffected. But in the other person, the Spirit of God is working to convict them through their conscience. The Spirit works on the conscience to make them concerned. That's awakening. So because apologetics, because reasoning isn't used, uh, people who are unconverted remain unconverted, okay? They're not awakened. They're not concerned, okay? But if apologetics were used, they could then come into the situation. And now the second reason we don't see many of these people today is because easy believism has so permeated the church, right? The church has lowered the bar of what a Christian is so far that everybody is virtually a Christian if you just simply believe the facts or if you pray the sinner's prayer, they believe that they're safe and in the kingdom of heaven. Now, what difference does it make then, okay, um, with regard to Arminianism and, and Calvinism when it, when it comes to this? Uh, what is this, the knowledge of the fact of this awakening um, the fact that a person can be awakened and unconverted, what difference does it make? Well, let's say that you have a person in this category, okay? He's unconverted, but they're concerned about the state of their soul. They believe what the Bible says. They know they're in danger. You've told them the gospel, you, and again, they, they accept it. But they also know in their hearts that they really don't want Christ. They don't want to go that direction. They know they're on their way to hell. They believe that's true. And they're offered Christ, but he doesn't appear desirable to them because they're unconverted. And they don't want to do what he calls them to do. I mean, we run into people like this. Um, I, I just can't give up the kind of life that I'm living. I, I can't give up these things. I, I love them too much, so I'm not going to do that. Even though I know these things are true, you know, I, I've run into people like that. So they do, they do exist. So <clears throat> how would each of these groups approach somebody like that? Well, Arminians would simply say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have that ability. You need to exercise it. But after they have told that person several times they need to do it and they still don't do it, eventually there's nothing else they can do. So John Gerson would say, they would shrug and say, well, I really don't know what to do at this point. I suppose you could pray for them. But they already know everything they need to know. They have the ability, but they're not exercising it from the Arminian perspective, right? So there's nothing more you can do, but the Calvinist does have something more they can do. The Puritans would tell them, seek the Lord while he may be found. See, they're never going to come unless they want to come, right? But knowing that God alone can change the heart by his Holy Spirit, they will tell this person to seek the Lord for his mercy. Even though they don't really want it, they do want it for self-preservation. They don't want to go to hell, but they really don't want it because they don't want to give up their sin. So it's an insincere kind of seeking, but they will tell him to seek the Lord for his mercy, to seek for the Spirit of God, to change his heart. And they do that by putting themselves in what they call the way of grace. Now, the way of grace is simply the way that God saves people when, when he saves them, okay? How does he do that? Well, in prayer, praying for God's mercy through his word, 
by reading it, and they, they would tell them to pray daily for God's mercy, to read the Word daily, um, to sit under the Word, under the preaching of the Word, to learn more about God's plan of salvation, to learn more about their need of salvation and the fact that they cannot do it themselves. And then, interestingly enough, they would do everything, they would tell them to do everything you, that they can in your natural strength to try and subdue their sins, okay? No one can expect mercy from God as long as they're in open rebellion against Him. Now, isn't that an interesting thought, okay? Now, this is what they believe how the Lord converts when He does convert, okay? He generally doesn't save people when they're walking down the street. He doesn't save them when they go to the theater. He, they don't, he doesn't save them when they go to a sporting event or in Edward's day, visit the local tavern, or when they're in conversations with you know, other unbelievers talking about things they shouldn't be talking about. He saves them through the means by which His Spirit works, and what we call the means of grace. And so that's what they would tell them to do. Saturate yourself with the means of grace, and perhaps if you seek the Lord, he might have mercy on you. During the time of the Great Awakening or the awakenings that took place, Edwards would tell his people, the Spirit of God is drawn near. And at this time, you don't want to provoke him, but instead you want to plead for mercy. And so do these things and seek after him, and he might have mercy on you. Now that, you see, recognizes the fact that no one can change their own heart. Only God can change their heart. So the Arminian is thinking, well, you already have enough in your heart to do it. Just do it. The Calvinist recognizes you don't, and so you need God's mercy and grace to do it. See, so that is a big difference between these two differing views. Well, let me sum all this up. This morning, as we renew our commitment, okay, to give ourselves to this cause that the Lord has called us to promote which is His kingdom, and we do that as we come to the table. Let's remember His call to us to make Him known to others, okay, to reach out to them in friendship, to build those relationships, to build those bridges, and be prepared to be open about our Christianity, you know, to share that simple message of the gospel. But as we do, let's remember that they can't receive it in their own strength. But even though that's true, we need to have the confidence that God will use that message to bring His people to Himself. It doesn't depend on our persuasiveness, though we need to be persuasive. You know, Jonathan Edwards would say that if we look like we don't believe it, then they're not going to believe it. We can be actually convincing them that it isn't true by the way that we live. We, we still need to believe it. We still need to Share it and be enthusiastic about it. We're going to learn this evening enthusiasm during the time of Wesley and Whitfield was, was considered a bad thing. But we need to be enthusiastic, you know. We need to be over the top, so to speak. We need to be really zealous and excited about these things. And we also need to be convinced, and that needs to come across too, that this is the only way that they can be saved from that danger. So... The Lord uses means, but we need to know that He will and that He will bring others to Himself. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer as we prepare to come to the table with all these things in mind, and let's ask the Lord to help us to be renewed in our commitment to do this.